driven Uber for a couple of years now and I was actually planning on calling it quits in early 2020, but then you know what hit and people were avoiding public transport like the plague, pun very much intended. So it didn't really make sense to do anything else for the time being. I still do it today, meaning I've been officially driving for Uber for three years and four months as of this October. In that time, I think I've given rides to literally thousands of different people, the whole spectrum, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I posted a whole bunch about the cooler fares I've had over in subs like r slash made me smile and r slash off my chest, but I've never really had the chance to answer anything like this before. I don't really like to talk about some of the crazy or frightening passengers I've given rides to, and I hope by the end of this you can understand why. But anyway, here are some of the worst, scariest, or generally most frightening passengers I've ever given rides to. The first of all the frightening fares I took were the two obvious looking gangbangers carrying a very suspicious looking package. The whole way they talked in low whispers in the back seat, letting out these devious little chuckles every so often. I couldn't quite hear what they were saying, but at one point, I made the mistake of making eye contact with one of them in the back seat. He had face tattoos, and when we locked eyes, he and his compadre fell silent. He then pipes up, asking if I ever get into any trouble. We're about the same age, and I can feel him sizing me up with the question, trying to see if I'm going to give him a punk answer or not. I just give him one syllable. No my intention being to engage him as little as possible. I wouldn't have even taken his ride request, but the display picture he was using was preface tattoo. You could tell it was the same guy, but it was most definitely a bamboozle. Anyway, this guy almost acts like I'd given him the opposite answer because he follows up with, you ever had to shoot somebody? I don't even carry a gun in the car, let alone ever had to shoot anyone. So again, I just gave him a one-word answer. No. He and his buddy think this is hilarious, and there's more low speech in the back seats before the guy says, Feels good. To shoot someone, I mean. Feels powerful. Immediately, I start getting nervous. I didn't think they were going to pull anything, but I definitely wanted to get the ride over as quickly as possible. I had no idea how far the little encounter was going to escalate, and like I said... If I had any inkling, I'd never have picked the guy up in the first place. We stop at a red light and I can see one of the guys in the back shifting around, taking something out of the bag they were carrying, but like I said, I just had no suspicion that they were about to do what they did. The next thing I know as the light goes green and we get moving again, I hear the mouthy kid laughing to himself, only it sounds like closer in my ear than it had been before. So just as I'm thinking... He's not leaning towards me, is he? I just feel something cold and metallic pushing into the back left of my head. I knew what it was almost immediately. I didn't need to hear the hammer being cocked to know. Then, I'm not sure if this is exactly what he said, but it's the gist of it. He says, If I shot you right now, this speed, you think we'd die too? I honestly couldn't tell you how long it took for me to come up with an answer. Could have been seconds, but I swear it felt like a whole couple of minutes. Just sitting there, weirdly calm, thinking, I might die tonight. Yeah, my heart was pounding, but this weird kind of survival instinct took over and I just thought, screw you guys. If I go, we all go. Like I said, I didn't answer at first because my first reaction was to put my foot down. By the time the speedometer read 50, I just said, Yep, at this speed, there's no way you'd survive. I felt the gun still pressed into the back of my head for a few seconds as they laughed, and that guy in the back seat only took it away when I ran a red light. Both of them thought this was equally hilarious, but I think the mouthy guy dropped his poker face for a second when he was like, Chill, chill, it was just a joke, homie. I kept our speed of a 50 until I pulled up outside their destination, still shaking as I parked up to let them out. Face tattoo guy had stashed the gun somewhere by then, but gave me some smug smile as he said, stay out of trouble, or something equally obnoxious as he got out of the back seat. 
I didn't touch my phone for a minute or two as he and his buddy crossed the street and walked into a bodega. Then, the second he was out of sight, I called the cops. That's the thing that always gets me about this incident. Like, what did he think I was going to do after he shoved a gun to my head? Drive off and carry on with my night? The cops were on the scene in more than a couple of minutes and I didn't even recognize them at first. I just saw two more guys with guns jump out of what turned out to be an undercover car and it wasn't until I spotted the badges around their necks that I realized they were cops. They were smart too. They didn't just burst in to try and grab the guy. They waited until he walked out, both hands full of whatever snack and slurpee he'd bought. They got him into cuffs without so much as a shot being fired. Some might call me a snitch, I call them idiots, because it's one thing to have those gangbanger dillweeds shooting and killing each other, but threatening civilians is something I won't stand for. I'm not some tough guy, I just hate bullies is all, always have. Now the next one that springs to mind seemed like it might have been more sad than anything, as when I picked this lady up, she was in tears, clearly in a great deal of distress. So I tried to stay respectful offered her a Kleenex, but otherwise kept the chatter to a minimum. Then about halfway through the ride, she gets a call. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but you just can't help yourself sometimes. You gotta turn the radio down so they can talk. There's literally nothing else going on, noise-wise, apart from the traffic outside. So as I'm listening to her speak, I gather that she's probably talking to her husband, or at least an ex-husband, and they've just had some kind of argument. I'm not sure what about. It definitely seemed like the husband was doing most of the talking and the vast majority of her contributions were like, no Tom, you can't do that Tom, I won't accept that. She's trying to talk sometimes but he's cutting her off and I'm starting to tune out when she suddenly blurts out, Tom, if you do that, I'll, I'll hurt the kids. I swear to God I thought I misheard her at first. I was honestly like, no. No way did she just say that. But she did, because she said it again, and whatever the argument was, ended. She apparently won it with that round. Shortly after, she said bye to whoever it was and hung up. I didn't say another word to her. I was rigid, imagining what those words might entail. Then I remember my eyes flicking to my Uber app and I suddenly remembered where I was supposed to be taking her. It was a Dwayne Reed, like the pharmacy chain. I didn't call the cops on her. I imagine her husband or whoever it was on the phone had seen to that. But I did pull over, told her to get out, and promised to refund her money. She tried to make out like she'd already paid me, but as some of you might know, not the case. I canceled the fare, told her I wasn't moving the car until she got out, and after a brief standoff, she ended up walking. I don't know what kind of mess of situation she was in, or if I could stop it but I sure could make it so I wasn't a part of it. I live here in Los Angeles, and as you probably already know, if you don't have a car here, you're pretty much screwed, and because of this very reason, Uber and Lyft are a hugely popular alternative to buses and trains. I've only ever had one bad Uber driver, but boy was he bad, and although I'm pretty sure the company fired him in the aftermath, it left a really bad taste in my mouth for some time after, and I took a long break from rideshare apps in the aftermath. So I took a routine Uber from La Brea to Crenshaw, and just as I'm about to get out, the driver asked me if I'm going to give him five stars. Normally I'd just have said, yeah, sure, but this guy was late, he wasn't even remotely friendly, and I just overall got bad vibes off the guy, so instead of giving him a straight yes, I was like, I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Then I go to climb out of the back seat. I just hear, click, as the doors in the back seat lock up. I can't open the doors, and I give the guy a look like, <laughs> very funny. He just comes back with, give me five stars, and I'll unlock the doors. Yeah, right, I was going to give him five stars after that. So I straight up just told him no, that five-star drivers actually let their passengers out at their destination. I figured he'd unlock the doors after that, and not wanting to lower his ratings anymore, but he didn't. 
They just kept the doors locked and reiterated that no five stars, no exit. Then when I say, okay, okay, I'll give you a good rating, and get out my phone, but he just snatches it right out of my hand and starts giving himself a review. I'd already decided to report the guy to Uber, but I decided to be polite enough to get my phone back. But no, the guy tossed it onto the floor and started to drive off. I have no idea what would have happened if that cop hadn't been driving by right as I started screaming for help. He pulled the Uber over and I got out as the driver tried explaining that it was all just a miscommunication. He wasn't arrested, but Uber assured me that he'd been fired in the end. I just hope they've improved their vetting process so that never happens to anyone again. Just over two years ago, I picked up the most important fare of my brief career in cab driving. I'd lost my job as a manager of a coffee shop I'd been working at, so in order to pay rent, I signed up to Uber in order to make ends meet. At first, it was a real godsend, and I'll throw out a trigger warning for cliches before I give you the usual spiel of, I was able to set my own hours, be my own boss, and meet cool people for a living. I know. It's old news by now, but it's true, and considering it was something of an occupational low point for me, it wasn't actually all that bad. But then I met Amy. Amy isn't this girl's real name, but by the end of the story I'm sure you'll understand if I tweak the details to protect the innocent, so to speak. Amy was pretty, had a four-star rating, tipped well, pretty much your dream passenger. But she was so much more than that to me, because... I've never hit it off so well with a girl in such a short space of time before. It started out with me asking how her day was after picking her up around 6 on a Friday evening. She was cheerful, said she had an okay week but said she was swallowing the frog, so to speak, by heading over to an ex's place to pick up some leftover belongings. If she got it out of the way then, she could just enjoy the rest of her weekend without worrying about it. Yeah, I didn't know what swallow the frog meant either. But according to her, it was a Mark Twain quote that goes something like this. If the first thing you do in the morning is to eat the frog, then you can continue your day with the satisfaction of knowing that this is probably the worst thing that will happen to you all day. Basically, get all the terrible things done early so you can just chill for the rest of the day. I like that idea, and it made me like Amy even more. We went from talking about her ex to talking about quotes we like to literature and sports it was a total scatterbrain conversation, but we seemed to match or complement each other at every turn. By the end of the ride, I had actual butterflies in my stomach, and when I promised to pick her up again soon if she'd ever needed a ride, she was like, why wait? She tore off a piece of paper from her purse, wrote her number on it with some makeup stick, and then handed it to me. I felt like I was on top of the world. I really did. She was smart, funny, and incredibly cute, and... For some reason, she seemed interested in me, of all people. I was so excited at the prospect of taking her out somewhere that I had to refrain from texting her almost right away. You gotta play it cool, right? So, that's what I did. I tried to keep my mind on work, let her do her thing, then maybe text her in the morning. But I couldn't even wait until then. When I finished my fares, I sent her a quick one to be like, just let me know if you're free for coffee over the weekend. Then I had some dinner played some Xbox, then went to sleep at around 3 a.m. The next thing I know, I'm waking up to the oh-so-familiar sound of my phone vibrating against my bedside table. I roll over, open one eye, and see unknown caller on the screen. And the first word that pops in my half-asleep brain is Amy. What she'd be doing calling me from an unknown number when I already had her saved in my contacts, I don't know, but... And still trapped in my sleepy ignorance, I answer the phone, expecting it to be her. I say, hello, and I'm instantly hit with confusion when I hear a guy's voice on the other end. He addresses me by name, asks if I drive for Uber, and when I confirm both, he tells me he's from the police, then asks if it'd be okay if he comes to visit me at home. Immediately, I'm like, what's this about? And he tells me it'd be better if we just spoke about it in private. Now, I'm not an idiot, I'm also not particularly anti-cop, but 
I know way better than to talk to one without a lawyer present. The only question was, if I'd broken some traffic law or something, why was this guy being so cagey about his reasoning for wanting to talk to me? So I pressed him like anybody would and told him I'd really rather know what was going on before I agreed to meet. He sighs, agrees, then starts telling me how one of my Uber passengers had been reported missing and that he was hoping I'd be able to help with the investigation. I know this is stupid. In fact, in light of what I said about keeping my mouth shut, what I did next was titanically moronic, but I just blurted out, Amy? There was a slight pause and the guy just goes, I think we need to have a chat, don't you? Now, two officers stopped by my place later that day. I just wanted to do everything I could to help. I remember sitting down, offering them some coffee, and then basically launching into a big tirade about how Amy had been talking about how the ride was to visit her ex, and that maybe, just maybe, he'd done something to her. But bizarrely, the detectives didn't seem very interested in her ex-boyfriend. The person they seemed interested in was me. I remember the sinking feeling I felt when they asked if Amy got back into my car after her collecting her stuff. I told them no, that a round trip would have obviously made sense, but that she also might have wanted to talk to him, maybe get some closure, you know, typical breakup stuff. Then they asked if I could prove that she got out of my car, which I could. The best piece of advice I'd ever gotten was to get one of those dual dash cams, the kind that records both the inside of the car and the outside front. The good news was I had that footage on hand, proving she didn't get back in my car. The bad news was, believe it or not, it was out of battery. It was like a practical joke I felt like against myself, and it would have been funny if the punchline wasn't me being put into cuffs. And I don't know if the cops thought I was trying to destroy the footage or whatever, but they grabbed that dash cam from me, told me I was under arrest, and literally, that was that. I know all I had to do was wait for the camera to charge and everything I told them could be confirmed. But good God, man, sitting in that cell, catastrophizing that the camera was broken and that I'd have a murder charge pinned on me, it was without a doubt the most terrifying few hours of my life, and just when I felt like I was about to lose my mind with worry, an officer opened up the door and basically just told me, sorry about that, you're free to go. I was still trembling as they booked me out of there and asked me if I needed a taxi or an Uber and those idiots didn't even give me a lift home. I was really, really angry with the police until I was asked to appear in court. After that, I understood why they suspected me. Amy's ex-boyfriend hadn't just killed her and disposed of her body. He'd come up with an elaborate plan to frame whatever taxi driver dropped her off. He played the heartbroken boyfriend, faked text messages, and even edited security camera footage, believe it or not. This all ended up getting used against him in court, but at face value, you could see why the police had me down as their number one suspect. It was actually the ex-boyfriend that reported her missing in the first place. He called the police right after he'd finished dumping her body in some random land out in the rural area, telling them some sob story about how they'd just gotten back together, and she wanted to pop back to her place to pick up a few bits before being driven back. To be honest, it was chillingly well thought out, and I think I'd have been grimly impressed if it wasn't for the fact that I was supposed to be the fall guy. Thankfully, he got life in the end. I didn't go to any more of the court sessions, it was just too upsetting to see Amy's family all torn up like they were, so I heard the rest through the local and national news. I stopped driving Uber after that, not because I was overly traumatized or anything, although I'd be lying if I said the whole thing didn't get into my head for a while after, more because I got a decent job offer for a management position at a corporate coffee shop. I went to a few therapy sessions which honestly really helped because for a while back there I weirdly blamed myself for Amy's death. But as my therapist told me, if it wasn't me, it would have just been some other driver and we can't just blame ourselves for facilitating what are ultimately the sins of others.
Just after 4 p.m. on Saturday, February 20th of 2016, a man by the name of Matt Mellon was preparing to head over to a friend's house in his hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Since Matt intended to drink alcohol that evening, he made the responsible decision to take a taxi to and from his destination. He got out his cell phone, opened up the highly popular rideshare app Uber, and requested a cab. At 4.21 p.m., an Uber employee driving a silver Chevrolet Equinox pulled up outside Matt's apartment. Matt climbed in, said hi to the driver, and they began their journey. Matt would later say the driver wasn't particularly warm, but this gave him no cause for concern and they promptly began their journey. At some point during the ride, Matt said his Uber driver received a call via a Bluetooth earpiece. Although he couldn't hear what was being said, Matt said he assumed the call hadn't been good because as soon as he'd hung up, the Uber driver began driving extremely erratically. Matt said nothing at first, but when the Uber driver entered an oncoming lane of traffic, drove through a median strip, ignored a stop sign, and sideswiped a Ford Taurus, Matt became understandably terrified. He asked the driver to slow down, but his pleas were ignored, and the terror quickly escalated until Matt was begging the man to stop and let him out. Again, his requests were ignored and Matt had to wait until the driver was forced to stop until he jumped out of a rear door and called 911. Matt gave local law enforcement as much information as he could regarding the Uber driver and license plate and was suitably shaken and outraged by his experience. But in truth, Matt had no idea how lucky he was to be alive as his driver had been Jason Brian Dalton a man whose violent descent into madness had only just begun. Born on June 22nd of 1970 in Greenfield, Indiana, little was known about Dalton's early years. We know he attended Kalamazoo Valley Community College, graduating in December of 1992 with an associate degree in law enforcement. But for some reason, Dalton didn't follow through with his dream of enrolling in the school's police academy program. In 1995, Dalton married his wife, Carol, who would go on to give birth to the couple's two children. Dalton supported his young family with jobs working for BMW, first as a mechanic and later as an insurance adjuster. Coworkers described him as a nice guy and a good family man, but one who also had something of a short temper. A former coworker who worked with Dalton at an insurance company remembers an incident in which Dalton began roaring at a customer over the phone slamming the handset down before pacing around the office, clearly in the grips of a furious rage. His co-worker said he and other employees found the behavior alarming, but Dalton later apologized, telling them that he was having a bad day, which apparently set their minds at ease. It's not clear how long before his mental break this was, but Dalton's madness would manifest in far worse things than just erratic driving. At 5.42 p.m., 25-year-old Tiana Carruthers was walking near the Richland Township apartment complex when a silver Equinox aggressively pulled up next to her. Dalton was in the driver's seat. The woman said he called out to her, using a name she didn't recognize, but when she turned to inform Dalton that she was in fact someone else, she was met with a torrent of handgun fire. She was hit four times in the left arm, legs, and back, Yet despite her abject terror, she was smart enough to play dead so that the shooter might move on, and it worked. Satisfied he'd killed her, Dalton put his foot down and sped off into traffic, running a red light and smashing into another vehicle as he fled the scene. Carruthers would survive the attack, but her left arm had to be surgically reconstructed as a result of her wounds. It's at this point that something rather bizarre occurs something which indicates that Dalton may have slipped into some kind of fantasy world of his own creation. After firing on the woman near Richard Township, Dalton drove to meet his wife and children at his parents' place in Comstock Township. It's there he explained that his Equinox had been damaged by a disgruntled taxi driver, who then fired gunshots at him after being enraged that his business was being eaten up by Uber. Although Dalton assured his wife that Uber's head office was dealing with the incident, he also gave her a 9mm Taurus handgun, telling her she may be in grave danger without it. He instructed her not to go to work, not to take their kids to school, 
and not to leave the house unless it was an emergency. Carol begged him for more answers, but it's apparent that Dalton told her that keeping her in the dark meant keeping her safe, and he'd shed more light on things once the crisis had blown over. He then switched vehicles, taking his wife's black Chevy HHR and Unbelievably, after almost murdering a woman in what amounted as a drive-by shooting, Dalton carried on accepting ride requests using his employee's version of the Uber app. Those he gave rides to during this time said that there was nothing remotely untoward about Dalton, and he was warm, friendly, and drove as safely as can be. All until just after 10pm when Dalton arrived at a Kia dealership in Kalamazoo. According to one witness, who was perusing potential purchases with her 17-year-old boyfriend, Tyler Smith, and his 53-year-old father, Richard, they were approached by a strange man who asked them what kind of vehicle they were looking for. The man didn't appear to be any kind of salesman, so it was with a degree of confusion that the men began to answer him, yet as they did so, the strange man pulled out a handgun, shredding each of them with 18 bullets fired from an extended magazine. The witness ran for cover as another in a Burger King parking lot across the street pulled out their phone, filming the shooter as they fled the scene. The vehicle in question was a black Chevy HHR with Jason Dalton in the driver's seat. Ten minutes later, Dalton pulled up near the parking lot of a Cracker Barrel in Texas Township, just five miles from the road from the Kia dealership. Just as he pulled up, Four people in two different cars were trying to exit the parking lot. Dalton reloaded his handgun, took aim, and fired. One witness observed Dalton as he exited his vehicle in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, before approaching one of the vehicles he'd fired upon. According to them, Dalton asked one wounded passenger a question, then, when she answered, he executed her with a single shot to the head. To this day, it's not clear what this question was, but it's more than likely Dalton would have executed her no matter what she'd said. There was no method to his madness. He desired only to kill. 14-year-old Abigail Kopf was also shot during this incident, with the bullet smashing off an entire section of her skull. She underwent a number of emergency surgeries and would go on to miraculously survive the attack, despite losing her elderly 68-year-old adopted grandmother, Barbara Hawthorne, in the process. Following both murders, the dispatch centers of the Kalamazoo Emergency Services were set alight with calls reporting the shootings. With the grim realization setting in that the city was faced with an extremely dangerous instance of a mobile active shooter. Thanks to new installed security cameras at the Kia dealership, the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety were able to put out extremely accurate descriptions of both Dalton and the vehicle he was using, and the cops went into overdrive trying to track and arrest him. Yet even more incredibly, Dalton actually continued to take Uber fares even as the subject of an intense police manhunt. At 12.04 a.m., he picked up three passengers before dropping them off at a dormitory on the Western Michigan University campus. These passengers later told police that Dalton wasn't overly friendly, but also did nothing to alert suspicion. Just minutes later at 12.12 a.m., Dalton gave four people a ride to their hotel. During the ride, one of these hotel guests had been thumbing through social media on their phone and happened to come across reports of the recent shootings. They read the description of the shooter in the vehicle he was driving, and noted with morbid amusement that they were riding in a similar-looking vehicle, with a similar looking driver. You're not the shooter, are you? They reportedly asked Dalton. And no, was all he said. Around 20 minutes later at 12.36 a.m., a Kalamazoo County Police Sergeant observed a black Chevy HHR dropping off some passengers. He followed the vehicle, matching the license plate with that of their supposed shooter, and requesting backup before he made his move. Four minutes later, he and a fellow officer conducted a traffic stop on Dalton, who appeared to grab for something under his seat as they approached. The officers rushed him, pulling open his car door and dragging him out onto the pavement outside. Only once they had the cuffs on him did they realize Dalton was wearing a bulletproof vest, and a subsequent search of his car revealed that he was in the possession of two 9mm handguns, one Walther P99 and one Glock 19 
neither of which he had a license for. Another 15 long guns were recovered from his home, and it became apparent that Dalton had prepared himself for a long and bloody standoff with pursuing law enforcement. In the immediate aftermath of Dalton's arrest, American President Barack Obama praised the Kalamazoo police and pledged the complete support of federal authorities in the investigation that followed. Governor Rick Snyder took to Twitter expressing his sorrow and condolences to the families of the victims. Uber's chief security officer, Joe Sullivan, also released a statement which read, We are horrified and heartbroken at the senseless violence in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Our hearts and prayers are with the families of the victims of this devastating crime and those recovering from injuries. We have reached out to police to help with their investigation in any way that we can. Just two days after he was arrested, Dalton was charged with six counts of first-degree murder, then returned to court in May of the same year, where he interrupted the testimony of Tiana Carruthers, making a number of indecipherable outbursts. Carruthers burst into tears. Dalton was dragged out of the courtroom and he later appeared via live video feed from his jail cell. Yet despite his initial belligerence, on January 7th of 2019, Dalton pleaded guilty to all charges and was later sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole to be served at Oaks Correctional Facility. To this day, it's not clear why Jason Dalton chose to kill six people on that fateful February night. He's never given a media interview, and he's never attempted to explain his behavior. However, one thing we do know is that, following the pretrial proceedings, it became apparent that Dalton's attorneys would seek an insanity defense. He then underwent a 60-day psychiatric evaluation in June of 2016, conducted by the Michigan Center for Forensic Psychiatry in Saline. This evaluation was set to conclude on August 15th, but just three days prior, psychiatrists announced an unexpected six-week extension to the evaluation. Then, when these additional six weeks were up, psychiatrists stated their evaluation was still inconclusive, and Dalton was declared fit to stand trial. Again, it's not clear why the evaluation was extended for so long. It could be because Dalton's defense attorneys wanted to keep him detained until he could adequately trick his doctors into thinking he was insane. But it's also possible that Dalton and his motives proved completely indecipherable, that his timing and choice of victims were so random that head nor tail could be made of his bloodthirsty killing spree. Then, just when it seemed like he'd remained tight-lipped about the murders, Dalton purported to tell his doctors why he'd killed that night. Dalton said that the iPhone can take you over, a report stated, adding, He recognized the Uber symbol as being that of the Eastern Star, and described how a symbol of the devil would appear as a horned cow head before he had lost control of his body. Dalton also stated that he never really aimed when shooting, and that somehow the devil directed his bullets into those he fired at. It's unclear if his doctors believed him or not, but what is clear is that a man who tried very hard to seem insane was eventually declared mentally fit to face punishment for his crimes. His true motives might always remain a mystery, but we live in a world where there is little time to reflect on just one madman with a gun. There's always another, and another, in an unceasing cycle of bloodshed, grief, and death. Twenty-one-year-old Samantha Josephson grew up in Robbinsville, New Jersey as the daughter of Seymour and Marcy Josephson. While majoring in political science at the University of South Carolina, Samantha studied abroad in Barcelona and planned on attending the Drexel University School of Law after her 2019 graduation. Samantha was a girl who showed boundless potential, who was potentially looking at a partial scholarship to Rutgers, but all her dreams would be snuffed out after making just one fatal mistake. On the evening of March 28, 2019, Samantha went out drinking with friends at the Bird Dog Bar in downtown Columbia. At around 2 a.m., they decided to call it a night, and like so many of us have done before, Samantha pulled out her phone and ordered an Uber. Just nine minutes later, surveillance footage from the Bird Dog shows a black Chevrolet Impala pulling up outside. Samantha steps outside, enters the vehicle, and greets her driver. The man at the wheel was named Nathaniel Rowland. 
and although he didn't say anything as Samantha climbed into his car, he hadn't actually been expecting a passenger. You see, the car that Samantha had climbed into wasn't her Uber. It was just a similar looking vehicle she'd drunkenly mistaken for her ride. You'd expect Roland to ultimately tell her to get out of the car, but he didn't. He simply engaged the locks, trapping Samantha inside, then drove off. It's not clear whether or not Samantha realized her mistake before Roland stopped the vehicle, but at some point, Roland parked up his Impala, pulled out a knife, and inflicted a sustained and savage attack upon the terrified Samantha. Using a bizarre-looking two-bladed knife, Roland proceeded to stab Samantha 120 times. She attempted to shield herself, but she was trapped, and Roland was armed. As well as several horrific defensive wounds, Roland also stabbed Josephson in her head with so much force that the knife went through her skull to her brain. But the killer blow seems to have come when he stabbed her in the carotid, one of two main arteries that carries blood to the brain. Samantha also sustained wounds to her face, neck, shoulder, torso, back, lung, leg, and feet, bleeding out within just 10 to 15 minutes. Roland then dumped Samantha's body in the New Zion field, where she was discovered by a handful of local turkey hunters. The following morning, Samantha's roommates became deeply concerned when they found she hadn't returned home. Police rushed into action, easily tracing her last known whereabouts to the Bird Dog Bar and to Nathaniel Roland's black Chevy Impala. Officers later happened across Roland while he was out driving, and after a traffic stop was attempted, Roland jumped out of his stationary vehicle and began to flee. Inside his car, police officers found a container of liquid bleach, germicidal wipes, and a bottle of window cleaner. But perhaps the most incriminating piece of evidence was Samantha's phone, which Roland had foolishly chosen to keep. He was arrested, questioned, and tissue samples were taken. Disturbingly, the tissues under Roland's nails tested positive for Samantha's DNA meaning whatever he was doing after he'd killed her, it had been rigorous enough for particles of her skin to become embedded under his nails. Roland was soon charged with Samantha's kidnap and murder, and it became apparent that Samantha wasn't his first kidnapping victim. He had apparently carjacked a woman at a stoplight in October of 2018 and was extremely violent in the commission of the crime, beating her and threatening her before they drove to an ATM to almost empty her bank account. In July of 2021, Roland was found guilty of kidnapping and murdering, with a judge sentencing him to life in prison. The same judge, a veteran of the legal circuit, said the murder was perhaps the most heartless and severe he'd ever seen, denying Roland's request for leniency. It's also easy to see why. Roland displayed some horrifying predatory behavior. When a stranger accidentally climbs into their car, most correct thinking people simply laugh it off, perhaps getting a little prickly if they're in a bad mood. But Roland found a stranger climbing into his back seat, and his first thoughts were nothing short of bloodthirsty. Samantha Josephson made an honest and simple mistake, and Nathaniel Roland made her pay with her life. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, teleportation is possible.